Hi, I'm Sky Almeida, Senior Vice President in the Green Investment Group in the Americas. I'm excited to continue our Green Talks content series where we're discussing critical actions that need to be taken during this decisive decade. I'm joined today by Andrew Jones from Climate Interactive to discuss the different impacts of technologies and policies on global emissions, air pollution and the climate. And what's interesting about today is we're going to be using a climate simulator called En-ROADS that was developed by Climate Interactive. So welcome, Drew. It's great to talk to you again. Well, I'm happy to be here, Sky. And uh, we come out of Climate Interactive, which is a not-for-profit think tank here in the United States. And we partner with MIT Sloan Sustainability Initiative to build this simulator and the guiding motivation for it is really that research shows that showing people research doesn't work. We've been publishing papers about what will really address climate change, what's needed to have renewable energy and less fossil fuel emissions, but uh, it's not sinking in. So we developed an interactive simulator, En-ROADS, that's free and online, and I'm excited to play with it with you right now to play out some different futures, to test your thinking and see what it takes to get well below two degrees and keep our economies thriving. Yeah, great. I, I have heard, I like that you say play with it because I've heard En-ROADS described as a choose your own climate and energy adventure. So <laughs> let's go on an adventure. Let's see if we can, we can get under two degrees warming, um, ideally under 1.5 degrees, which was the Paris Agreement stretch target, but let's start with two. Um, and, and before we do, where, where exactly are we tracking at the moment in terms of, of global emissions and temperature rise? I think that's a good starting point, and then let's talk about how we can get to two degrees. I'm going to pull up uh, the model itself to look at it. Okay, so, yeah, let's see where things are headed under a business-as-usual future. And this is calibrated to the integrated assessment models. There's a scenario that they call SSP2, their shared socioeconomic pathways, uh, number two, the middle of the road scenario for their baseline. And when we calibrate against it, you can look over on the left and you see that brown line, that's coal from 2000 to 2100. And oil in red peaking around 2060, natural gas in blue, here's wind and solar in green, bioenergy and nuclear. If that's the source of emissions, that's where we are getting our energy then what we expect to see is for greenhouse gas emissions, and that includes methane and nitrous oxide and from agriculture. Those emissions would go up and up and up, and we would get to about 4.1 degrees. The kinds of impacts we've seen of climate change here in California right now, wildfires last year in Australia, of course, and other impacts, sea level rise, uh, are around a little over one degree, which is where we are today. So 4.1 degree is a world we can adapt to we want to do much better. That's why we're so excited you and others are investing in alternatives. This is where we're headed. We can do better. Uh, let's think about how we can make that happen. Yeah, and, and perhaps we can start by focusing in. I realize there's, there's lots of levers we can pull in your simulator and, and some of those are policies and we can come back to those. But to start, I'd love to focus on the sectors where the Green Investment Group is most active. So. You know, we have over 25 gigawatts under development globally, uh, primarily in onshore and offshore renewables. We're also uh, looking at energy storage, waste to energy, electric mobility, carbon capture and sequestration, and even hydrogen. So can we, can we look at what the simulator tells us about the impact of, of these types of technologies and how far that gets us towards two degrees versus the 4.1 I can currently see under business as usual? Yeah, thank you, Sky. I think you just mentioned uh, in, a, in a big picture, three big buckets of investments and policies that we could see around the world. And note, this is a global model, so this would show the impact if everybody in the world followed what you're doing. Um, the three areas I heard were renewable energy, um, you know, offshore wind and onshore wind and solar, electrification of transport, and then CCS. So let's take them one at a time. And you can see down here at the bottom are all the levers that we could change. You just talked about renewables. And uh, if you click on the three dots, you see not just uh, 
you see some more advanced features. In this case, how much would we be encouraging renewables and then some other things that can be changed for, with, with renewables. So first, think for a second, what do you expect to change up here in the top left? And think about which line you expect to change the most. And that green line is renewable. So that's, we know it's gonna go up, but what's gonna go down the most? What's it gonna displace? What's gonna stay in the ground because of the wind and the solar? So look and think about what you think is actually gonna happen and I'm gonna Imagine a world with more renewable energy, and then we'll see how it plays out through emissions and then temperature. So if we imagine a major growth, watch that green line leap up, and I'll play it again a couple times. The green line, this is a encouraging much more renewable energy. You can see over on the bottom right, exajoules, instead of going to about 200, go up well above 450. So it's more of a doubling by the end of the century of renewable energy capacity. And you also mentioned like with hydrogen and other things, if we imagine a better grid and better storage, then we actually could get even more growth. So I'm gonna imagine a breakthrough cost reduction in storage. It would get us in this case globally up to almost 600 exajoules per year of renewable energy. That would cut greenhouse gas emissions. Why is it doing that? Well, look at that line of coal. You can see where we were before Way back here, watch the brown line of coal go down and down. It is keeping coal in the ground. Also, some natural gas, the blue line went down. That has emissions go down, and it takes a significant dent out of future warming. 4 point went, went down to 3.8. Now, mind you, this is not a silver bullet, as you know. What happens when you don't touch storage? You can keep it. Um, business as usual, and it's just renewables. What do we see happen with natural gas in that scenario? So let's just try renewables alone. So I'm gonna encourage renewables, watch the green line go up. Natural gas goes down a bit. We see a little bit less natural gas. It's displacing coal, but it's also, because it's so cheap, it's out competing natural gas in some areas. And that's because the marginal cost of electricity production from renewables in green is well below gas, so you're out competing gas in some areas. What do you think about that? Why do you ask? Well, I mean, I'm very curious. It's a conversation, particularly in the US, about the role of natural gas in the transition and the impact that renewables can have without a breakthrough in um, energy storage alongside renewables. And when I say breakthrough, I mean, the technology exists, we're already deploying it at scale, but we need to see more of it. We need to do it more quickly. And ideally the costs need to come down as well. So I'm curious to see how the, the model accounts for that. Well, with renewables, and so we can imagine growth in renewables. And um, then beyond it, I think you talked about electrification of transport. And the dream here, of course, is to get that red line of oil to come down. And if we electrify transport, let's see what happens here. Um, right now, here's the test. So watch the red line of oil go down, and then we're getting globally, we're getting more of this electricity for the transport from two sources. We're getting, as you can see, a good bit more from wind and solar but also it is going to, in particularly in the developing world, in India and in China and other countries, it's going to coal to some degree. So that's not helping the whole cause for warming, but it is actually shaving a little bit more off of temperature. Not as much as we'd love and not as much as we would if we can really decarbonize the grid. So for electrification of transport to make a big difference on climate, we need to decarbonize the grid a good bit more for it to have a big result. Of course, you can imagine you know, if you did added things like less coal, less gas, maybe a carbon price, that electrification would have more of an impact. So relatively modest with just a little bit more renewables, but 3.8 is much better than 4.1. Yeah, it's an improvement. It's, it's obviously nowhere near where we need to be. So let's talk about some other, other measures that get us closer to two degrees. You mentioned coal. Um, what, let's talk about a scenario where investors stop investing in coal and we stop building new coal generation. What kind of impact does that have? What if the world stopped investing in new coal infrastructure, in this case in 2025, 
and it could be in a different year, uh, but here we go. And I'd like you to look at that brown line of coal that goes up. Imagine a world where we don't invest in it. Where do you think that temperature would go? Yeah, watch now what it does. The brown line of coal goes down. Now it gets a boost to renewables and green, also more natural gas. And overall, you've got greenhouse gas emissions flattening, and then we get to 3.4 degrees, a much better world. Now, most of the warming is happening now with natural gas and with oil. Those are the two fossil fuels that exist in the second half of the century. But a huge difference between 4.1 and 3.4 degrees. Um, you mentioned CCS. Yes, it would be great to look at direct air capture. So. Um, I realize, realize the technology is, is still coming along and not necessarily being deployed at scale, but yeah, let's focus in on that. Let's imagine what could be possible there. So I'm going to switch over and, and, and by the way, anyone who's watching this along can go and play and recreate this exact scenario themselves. You just go to enroads.org and the models here, pull up this screen for sources of removal. So over on the left, that's what's getting pulled out of the atmosphere. And I'm going to scroll down into technological carbon removal. There are five types. Uh, and I'll click on direct air capture. You can see the percent of the maximum potential. Now, when we have a choice like this that is about the future, about uh, highly uncertain futures, like how much is going to even be possible if we can do this at scale, uh, those assumptions are made very explicit here so that you can decide that you like what the Royal Society said in 2018. They said the middle was 2.8 gigatons CO2 per year, but it could be lower, it could be higher, but let's just go with their 2.8 estimate. Um, or do you like that? Do you wanna go with the middle road? Do you wanna dream a little bit, Sky? Where do you wanna go? Let's dream, let's dream big, Jerry. <laughs> all right, what if it went all the way to the maximum that they could imagine? Five gigatons a year, so I'm gonna go back and crank up the direct air capture to 100% of that potential. Five gigatons a year gets us just down to 3.3, 0.1 degree. Why does it not help that much? Like, unlike, notice the year. Talk about the decisive decade. Your, yeah. uh, you know, getting rid of coal happened so soon in the 2020s. It takes, you know, this is a technology that doesn't exist. We imagined it, it kicking off in 2030 and then growing steadily as the, as it, the industry grows, and then not really getting up to scale until 2060. That's too late to make the kind of difference we need in the carbon cycle to reduce warming in the future. So only 1.1 degree, but it takes many seeds to plant a garden. It takes many seeds. This is one, it's not a silver bullet, it's not the one that's gonna do it all. Uh, it could contribute. So your 3.4 is 3.3, before we go on to other, some other levers we could pull, for those who um, might want to drill into some of the assumptions in the model, it's great you mentioned the model, the simulator's publicly available, and I know there's how many pages, 350 page document outlining all of the assumptions. Yeah. So can you exactly. talk a little bit more about how people can, um, if they've got their own assumptions about different technologies, whether they can input those or? Yeah, yeah, so one of the key features of a model that we want to actually make an impact with people is it's gotta be transparent. And so what we allow for is, as I was showing you before, many of the assumptions we make explicit and changeable. Like one really important factor that uh, we study with renewable energy is the progress ratio. Every doubling of cumulative capacity of wind and solar reduces those costs 20%. So the progress ratio is one minus 20%, which is 0.8 right here. That is explicitly listed. We say, here's where it came from. This is the, the, the study, but it could be faster. If there's faster learning around the world, I'm gonna change that renewables. Let's say it's 30% and you drop it down here. And that gets you a little more growth in renewables. The green area expands a little bit more. Now we're at 3.2. So you can change many of the assumptions you can imagine new technologies. In this case, what if there's thorium fission? Nuclear fusion comes out of the lab. 
Imagine if that happened, how would that compete and then grow with other things? So we try to allow the user to have access to many of these assumptions in the technological space. But the other one that's really huge, of course, is uh, in climate sensitivities. And that is uh, some of the core carbon cycle and climate assumptions that scientists debate about. You can change and do real-time sensitivity testing to say if that sensitivity to a doubling of carbon from the climate is lower or higher, what would it matter? How much of a difference would it make on the insights that you're getting from your experimentation with the model? Right, and I think that's, I mean, it's really important that you can, that you're providing that transparency and people can adjust the assumptions and particularly given the, the audience you've used this with, I, I know that you've worked with Republicans, you've worked with Democrats, you've worked with that's large that. corporate. Yeah, so. That's right, um, that's right. I, I think that's one of the, the really big benefits of this publicly available simulator. It's not leading people down a particular path, it's letting them draw their own conclusions. So coming back to what we can do to get under two degrees, because we're still not even close. We're getting closer. Yeah, let's, let me give you some, some hints about where the sources of emissions are. Um, and you mentioned a carbon price. And uh, note that a carbon price is designed to do a largely what your banning of coal infrastructure in the future did. So adding it now wouldn't do nearly as much as just doing it you know, from scratch. So here we are back, just another version of the model, and you can imagine that we can explore the huge impact that a carbon price might have. You know, That was a very high carbon price, but it brings coal, oil, and gas all down at different times. But it also, importantly, brings energy demand down. So the cost of energy would go up globally if we had a carbon price. That sparks innovation in energy efficiency and conservation so that we would follow the blue line for energy consumption, not the black line. So that's a secondary impact of a carbon price and why it's so effective at shaving a full degree off of that, uh, a full degree off of the 4.1 future all the way down here to three. So it's really powerful. It's kind of an alternative to imagining a world of banning coal infrastructure. But for your scenario that was back here that we were just looking at, here you are at 3.2, I'd encourage you to look over at this graph of greenhouse gas net emissions. So what it shows you here in 2020 is land use CO2 in green, that's from deforestation. On top of it is the energy CO2, burning coal, oil, and gas, and then there's methane, the F gases like HFCs and SF6, and then nitrous oxide, which is mostly in fertilizer. So you can see heading out in the future, those are the emissions. And then do you see below it, you see that little gray area? That's your direct air capture removals. It's below the zero line, pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. So what's going in is up top, what's coming out is below. So given that, uh, and also looking over to here to see you still have some oil, you still have some gas, there's some hints. So what's next? Yeah, let's 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 tackle um, oil and agricultural emissions is another big source. Is that correct? Well, you mentioned oil and agriculture. So, which one do you want to try first? Yeah, let's try oil. Yeah. So, your focus there can be on the supply side, and you can say, you know, there's a divestment movement. There are people who are removing subsidies over here. You could say less oil that way. You could also imagine proved. Uh, energy efficiency in transport, you know, smaller cars, more efficient cars, more efficient transportation systems uh, by looking at energy efficiency in transport right here. We're already improving at half a percent a year, but we can improve faster. Do you want to go on the supply side or the demand side? Let's go supply side. Okay, watch if we imagine some more taxing less subsidies for the oil industry, that shrinking of oil. Now, mind you, we're already electrifying transport a good bit, but that really brings it down even more, point, another 0.2 point degrees, and this dark area of energy CO2 shrinks even more. Great, so that's a little bit more. What, what else? Can we look at agriculture? Should we look at 
afforestation. And actually, I also then want to come to building efficiency. Have you played with building efficiency yet? We have not. We have not touched it. Um, so you said agriculture, afforestation, building efficiency. So agriculture, uh, here we're already emitting a little less methane. Let's look at the methane. Methane emissions have gone down a little bit because the oil and gas industries have shrunk. So we don't have as much leakage and much less emissions from those industries. But we could also imagine uh, even less. So methane emissions from landfills, from wastewater, from cows and other parts of agriculture. Watch this huge potential, 3.0, a full half a degree. So this is not just about energy. The huge potential by addressing agriculture and some of these other areas. So we're at 2.5. You mentioned next afforestation. There's a lot of hope that's been pinned on growing trees, the Trillion Trees Initiative here in the U.S. We already have some removals from direct air capture, but it is a huge, like a huge amount of planting trees would increase afforestation up there to about five gigatons, but it's really only 0.1 degree. People have been talking about it, frankly, and exaggerating some of those results. So again, talk about the decisive decade. The decisive decade is not the 2070s you know, here when this really kicks in. It takes a long time to find land, plant trees, and then slowly for photosynthesis to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. It takes a long time. The decisive decade framing leads you to the things that you were talking about before around coal and renewables, things that get deployed immediately. So afforestation helps, we're at 2.4. We can also cut deforestation. That's another 0.1 degree, but it's relatively modest. 2.3 degrees, you mentioned efficiency. I'm gonna go over here and we're gonna look at energy demand is already growing a little more slowly. But if we were to imagine better HVAC systems, lighting, motors, system design, in industry, in buildings, et cetera. Uh, right now we're already improving at 1.2% a year. If it jumped up to 3.5% a year, look at that big change in energy consumption globally if we got much more efficient. 2.3 goes down to 2.1. Sky, you're so close. You're so close. 2.1, what's, what's next? You're a policymaker or you're an investor. What do you do? What do you do to get us below two? Well, look over on the left and just have to ask, where are the emissions coming from? Where is the pollution coming from? Look at over on the right. You can see it's energy CO2. Where is that coming from? Well, there's the gas. There's the oil. So less natural gas, maybe a carbon price to affect all of it. Boom, 1.8, you did it. Congratulations, you did it. There it is. And uh, one thing I can do for you, and if we can tweet it, you go over here and uh, share it on Twitter or copy the scenario link, and I'll send it over to you, and you can send it around to the world to say, here's uh, one scenario that gets us well below two degrees. The first time I saw the simulator, and, and you hear it time and time again, there is no silver bullet. We'd, we'd all love to, to just be buying carbon offsets and continuing with our current consumption behaviors and economic activity and, and ideally offset everything to get to two degrees or 1.5, but it's pretty clear that we can't do that. So we um, have to think about a myriad of solutions. Some of them are policies, obviously, uh, and a lot of them can actually be done by private investors. And I think it's exciting to see new technologies become investable and, you know, I think in the green investment group we're leading the way is certainly around some of the, the newer technologies um, and trying to de-risk those and make them look more like traditional infrastructure assets that uh, lower risk, lower cost of capital investors will, will want to actually acquire. But um, there's still a lot even to be done around onshore and offshore renewables. So our 25 gigawatt pipeline is keeping us very, very busy, but we do need to look at, at other solutions. So Drew, closing remarks, any, anything you really want to leave with people considering that the kinds of people watching this are, are probably investors, they might be renewable energy developers, they might be policymakers? 
so I think what we just saw, Scott, is the scenario that you put together and illustrates some key points about the transition to a world well below two degrees. And as you said, first of all, it was a combination of actions that would be required of the investment community, but also things that civil society and government collective action could make happen. And as you saw, there was no silver bullet. Even a very high carbon price is not a silver bullet if that was possible to pass around the world. Um, there was no action that gets you all the way. As opposed to that, the alternative is that, as I like to say, there, it takes more than one seed to plant a garden. And you planted a lot of seeds, restricting coal, more renewables, uh, electrifying transport, from carbon capture and storage, direct air capture, actions in agriculture, in buildings and energy, buildings energy efficiency, less deforestation, in trees. There was just a wide range of actions. But that really su supports the third point, which is it's still possible. We can bend that curve to keep us below two degrees. It's biogeochemically possible. It's not feeling particularly socially or politically accessible today to do it, but it still is possible. Now, all of those scenarios involve kept keeping a lot of coal, oil, and gas in the ground. Uh, there aren't scenarios that go around that fact that we need to really restrict the, the burning of coal, oil, and gas. But overall, it's possible. And it really, if we look closely at co-benefits to many people who need co-benefits, things like better air quality, better treatment of water systems, hopefully biodiversity, addressing many of the other challenges that society faces. So uh, overall, it's not going to be yeah, easy to make that happen. It, but we think it's not going to be easy, but it'll be worth it. So thanks again, Drew. And it's great that the, the simulator is available online for other people to play around with. I also want to encourage people to visit our website, greeninvestmentgroup.com, where we'll be posting other short expert-led videos like this on the energy transition during this decisive decade.